The second astronomer, who criticized Velikovsky's electromagnetic concept in the early part of the Velikovsky affair, was James Warwick, who specifically wrote a paper on magnetic stars that, like Menzel's, was supposedly a devastating calculation and rebuttal to Velikovsky. He claimed that the astronomers had been working with magnetic star motions for years and found nothing to indicate their high magnetic fields had any influence on motion in this regard. The original criticism appeared in Kronos, Volume 10, Number 3, 1985, pages 10 and 11. My answer to Warwick was published three years later. Emmanuel Velikovsky claimed that two magnetic stars orbiting at close quarters would not be influenced by gravitational interaction, but also by magnetic interaction. Earth and Upheaval, New York, 1955, Forum Address, page 297. Radio astronomer James Warwick calculated the influence of two magnetic stars, each of 10,000 Gauss, separated by three solar radii and aligned with their dipole moments directed toward each other to maximize the magnetic interaction. Based on his careful calculation, he could claim that the magnetic interaction between the magnetic stars was about a billion times smaller than gravity, far too small to influence the orbits of these bodies. We wish to challenge this conclusion based on mathematics and physics and offer observed evidence that denies the validity of Dr. Warwick's calculation and conclusion. Magnetic stars fall into two classes. The first type of magnetic star is called an AP star. John Lewis Tassel, in his Theory of Rotating Stars, Princeton, New Jersey, 1978, page 430, informs us that almost all high-intensity magnetic fields known in non-degenerate stars are found in the peculiar A-type, AP stars. Therefore, these stars are on the main sequence of stars with the largest magnetic fields. The other class of magnetic stars are the AM stars, which, if they have magnetic fields, they are not nearly as powerful as the AP stars with the strongest fields. What is quite unique is that the magnetic axes are A, great angle with rotational axis and thus with the magnetic poles are observed to be close to the equator. When stars are in close binaries, tidal forces drive the two stars into a position in which their rotational axis move toward parallelism, thus the point where very close companions would be in orbit around a magnetic star is at the rotational equator, where in AP magnetic stars, the gravitational forces will be in competition with the dipole moment's magnetic forces in order to form a close binary system like that proposed by Warwick. There is also another phenomenon observed with magnetic stars, the distribution of the obliquity angles of the magnetic axis appear to be random, but becomes increasingly bimodal as evolution proceeds. Therefore, as the star ages, the magnetic axis will move to align itself with the rotational axis. The magnetic axis of stars with the strongest magnetic fields will, based on this data, be found nearer to the rotational equator. Thus, any star that forms a binary that is close to these magnetic stars, especially those with the strongest magnetic fields, namely the AP type, must do so against at least one of the magnetic dipole moments. It is well observed that both types of magnetic stars, AP and AM, form binary systems. But there is a significant difference that appears to deny Dr. Warwick's views that electromagnetism is an inconsequential force in these star systems. Spectroscopic binary systems are double stars that are so close together that they can only be distinguished by spectroscopic analysis. Nearly all main sequence stars can and do form spectroscopic binary systems. Based on Dr. Warwick's calculation, there is absolutely no reason for the highly magnetic AP stars not to be members of such spectroscopic systems. The fact of the matter is that AP stars are rarely found to have spectroscopic binary companions, and never so far as I have been able to find with another AP companion. And we are specifically told that AP stars are generally slow rotators, but they differ from AM stars in being single rather than spectroscopic binaries. The Fact on File, Dictionary of Astronomy, 2nd edition, Illingworth, New York, 1985, page 22. Since all other main sequence stars have such binaries, one astronomer remarked, there seems to be a severe shortage of such spectroscopic binaries among AP stars, while M. Floquet in Blastoli's AP Binaries in Astronomy and Astrophysics Abstracts, Volume 30, Part 1, 1983, page 439, has come to the conclusion that the magnetic field seems to play an important role in the relation between binary and AP phenomena. That is, gravitation being about a billion times more influential 
than magnetism, or even several millions of times more so, does not explain why these highly magnetic stars seem to be singular rather than, in rare cases, form spectroscopic binary systems. But what if the extremely weak magnetic AM stars? Interesting. We are informed that they are almost all short period spectroscopic binaries. Clearly, the only force that distinguishes AP stars from AM stars is the strength of their magnetic poles, and perhaps the inclinations of their magnetic axis to the rotational axis. There is no other principle that coherently explains the fact that AP stars with high magnetic fields are overwhelmingly single and rarely spectroscopic binaries, is, as Velikovsky suggested, an electromagnetic repulsion that is too strong to overcome by gravity at close distance. The only force which coherently explains the fact that AM stars with weak or tiny magnetic fields are, by and large, almost all spectroscopic or very close binary systems, is an electromagnetic repulsion that is too weak and thus allows companions to move close to them. In addition, we were informed above that all magnetic stars are slow rotators, unlike the same size stars without their magnetic axis skewered toward their equators. This is clearly a direct indication that the inclination of the magnetic axis pushed through the galactic magnetic field are slowed. But Warwick, in both cases, never answered nor mentioned any of these phenomena, which directly undercut and contradicted his calculations. But it is even remotely possible that Warwick, an authority on magnetic stars, was ignorant of binary behavior of AP and AM stars, and of the fact that they were all slow rotators. When he presented his challenge to Velikovsky and researchers, of course, he had to have known about all these elements. But in all the years that this response to his critique was presented, he never presented or even acknowledged the answer to his criticism existed. He merely presented mathematical equations as proof, but withheld from his readers the actually observed behavioral characteristics of magnetic stars that were in direct contradiction to that math. As with Menzel, when confronted by the evidence, Warwick failed to carry out his scientifically and scholarly duty and left his erroneous criticism in the literature. What we're really saying is an electric current must exist somewhere in the neighborhood of a magnetic field, every magnetic field. The third instance of the early Velikovsky affair, wherein a critic attacked Velikovsky's concept that there was an electromagnetic force in addition to gravity operating, is Ivan King, an astronomer and one of the organizers of the 1974 AA AAAS Symposium on Velikovsky, who bluntly stated before the meeting was even held, What disturbs the scientist is the persistence of these views, in spite of all the efforts that scientists have spent educating the public. It is in this context that the AAAS undertakes the Velikovsky Symposium. Although the symposium necessarily includes a presentation of opposing views, we do not consider this to be the primary purpose of the symposium. None of us in the scientific establishment believes that a debate about Velikovsky's astronomical electromagnetic force views would be remotely justified in a serious scientific meeting. Strangely enough, King's research deals with the behavior of globular clusters that are spherical in shape and are made up of 10,000 to 1 million mostly old red giant stars. There are a few hundred globular clusters in the Milky Way, with the greatest concentration of stars toward their central cores. Also unusual is that these globular clusters do not revolve about the galaxy as do the stars in the galactic disk on relatively circular orbits. Rather, these clusters have orbits that are highly elliptical, like those of most comets in the solar system. Globular clusters orbit toward and away around the galactic core. Furthermore, the orbits of the stars in these globular clusters do not orbit its core in circular orbits, but do so in orbits that are highly elliptical. This creates a major gravitational problem in explaining how these clusters can survive. Over time, stars will approach one another and gravitational interactions will accelerate one of them so greatly that it will leave the cluster forever. Therefore, these globular clusters should be shedding members and becoming ever smaller in size. However, when a star is kicked out of the cluster, it will remove gravitational energy or angular momentum with it and make up for this loss of gravitational energy. The star that interacted with the escaped one must move inward to counterbalance that loss. The law of conservation of angular momentum is fundamental to gravitational theory and demands this.
Therefore, because the globular cluster is now somewhat smaller in size, the stars in it left behind will move closer to one another and will then repeat the interaction process again and again, sending stars out of the cluster while the cluster continues to contract. But, for some reason, this law of gravity is not working in these globular systems. King well understood this fundamental contradiction to gravitational theory and admitted this. Now, this not only relates to the hundreds of globular clusters in the Milky Way, but to the billions upon billions of other spiral galaxies with globular clusters throughout the universe. In other words, celestial mechanic equations cannot account for the failure of these fundamental laws to work as they should throughout the universe. Here, then, is how King dealt with this massive negation of the theory he claims disproves Velikovsky. Although globular clusters are obviously long-lived, they are not immutable. Slowly but steadily, stars evaporate, escape from the cluster as they reach escape velocity from the cluster during their interactions. The gravitational theory that adequately predicts the resulting evolution of the cluster is basically simple, but many of the details have remained elusive. The binding energy of a cluster holding it together is really an energy deficit, the energy it would take to accelerate all the stars to their escape velocity and tear the cluster apart. To reach escape velocity, a star must acquire enough kinetic energy to overcome the cluster's negative gravitational energy. Thus, the stars that escape are those with the most kinetic energy, whereas the amount of gravitational energy they contribute to the cluster is no more than average. As a result, the evaporation of stars increases the amount of binding energy per star remaining in the cluster as the cluster contracts. According to the current theory, it does not reach a steady state. Instead, energy from the contraction of the cluster is converted into kinetic energy of stellar motion, thereby heating the core. The core become more dense and the stars in it near it remove more rapidly. Therefore, more stars evaporate and the core continues to contract and heat without bound until it is infinitely dense. Donald Lyndon Bell, proponent of the theory, has dubbed this positive feedback phenomenon of the gravitational catastrophe. When the theory was first put forward in 1960 by Michael Hennon of the Nice Observatory, there was little observational evidence to support it. Only the globular cluster M15 shows any sign of the sharp density peak one would expect in a collapsed core. Recently, however, my colleague Stanislaw Jorgovsky and I have been making more careful observations of a large number of globular clusters. We have observed at least a half a dozen displaying density peaks we believe to be an evidence of core collapse. Still a half a dozen is not many. Gravitational theories of cluster evolution predict that a much larger fraction of the ancient globular clusters in the Milky Way should have collapsed by now. The various analytical and numerical models also concur in predicting that once the core collapse begins, it proceeds so rapidly one would be unlikely to observe it in progress. Why have more central density peaks not been detected? One possibility is that the predicted timescales for core collapse are too short. A more likely explanation is that some mechanism halts the collapse and even causes the core to re-expand back to normal. In other words, King is directly saying that something else must be happening in the globular cluster that is acting against gravity to keep it from collapsing. That is, as the cluster begins to develop a smaller core, something else comes into play and offsets the collapse, and then actually re-expands or pushes the cluster back to its normal size. He had completely overlooked that this specifically would be explained by Velikovsky, who maintained that the charged celestial bodies, when close to one another, would be cushioned by their repelling magnetic fields. Yet, here again, we have Ivan King offering some sort of mechanism at close quarters is able to overwhelm gravity.
William R. Corliss understood the dilemma that underlay the gravitational processes in globular clusters and kept them from collapsing as they shed stars into space and calls the mechanism just what it is, a force. Some unidentified force at the cores of the cluster may be operative. What force outside of gravity is known to exist in space except electromagnetism? But King would gouge his eyes out rather than suggest Velikovsky might be right. All sorts of ideas have been invoked to fill this gaping hole in gravitational theory. For example, one is that as the core collapses, many close binary stars will then form an offset to single stars that can interact, but only information for this is an interpretation of the of X-ray sources at the cores of these clusters. But this explanation only applies to some globular clusters. If the theory was correct, it would apply to nearly all of them. Other scientists have even suggested that an undiscovered form of matter called dark matter somehow halts the collapse, though this highly speculative idea is not accepted. Theory has been piled on theory in an attempt to salvage the globular cluster contradiction for gravitation theory. Earlier, it was suggested that these clusters are rotating, which would clearly resolve the problem since the stars would be in more circular orbits and rarely interact. But as Dewey Larson pithily explained, showing that some clusters rotate is meaningless. All must be rotating quite rapidly to give any substance to the hypothesis that rotational forces counterbalance the gravitational attraction. If even one cluster is not rotating or is rotating slowly, this is sufficient to demonstrate that rotation is not the answer to the problem. Only Velikovsky's theory that charged celestial bodies would exhibit a cushioning effect a close range explains the behavior of globular clusters throughout the universe. King, of course, could never consider this because it would mean Velikovsky could be right. In every case, in the early Velikovsky affair, the arguments raised to dispute that electromagnetic effects play no role in celestial mechanics have been answered. At no time did Velikovsky's critics ever acknowledge that their attacks were answered in Velikovskyan or other literature nor did they ever respond to the answers and evidence provided by Velikovsky or proponents of his ideas. They failed to act in all cases to act in a scholarly, scientific, or rational manner, and eluded their duty by simple denial of these realities they could not explain away nor prove were invalid. Before going on, it must also be reported, as did Colin Wilson, his electromagnetic theory led Velikovsky to predict that Jupiter would be found to emit radio waves and that the Sun would have an extremely powerful magnetic field. It could be said that many of Velikovsky's theories, including the idea that Jupiter and the Sun have large magnetospheres, are now accepted as part of astrophysics. Except, of course, no one acknowledges that Velikovsky was the first one to formulate them. So too, the electromagnetic evidence below to be presented is unacknowledged by the scientific community. Interesting. The next one coming up is the, the experimental evidence. It's very interesting that these esteemed astronomers just can't find it in themselves to give Velikovsky one bit of credit, but they want everyone to believe in dark forces and black holes. It's amazing. Thanks for listening. Some unidentified force 